Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be talking about not craft but K-Raft. Craft is just some mac and cheese that I like to eat because I am cultured. Uh, anyways, let's go ahead and get into it because I've got a bit of a busy week. Uh, so we'll get started. Alrighty, so like I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about K-Raft. So basically, when we're running an actual uh, Kafka cluster, we basically need to store a ton of metadata. And we spoke about this in the last couple of videos, so I'd recommend giving those a watch if uh, you're not really sure what we're talking about already. But basically, uh, Kafka brokers have many different partitions or topic partitions stored on them. Each one has some state associated with whether it's working or it's not working. Also, every single topic has a bunch of replicas, or rather every single topic partition has a bunch of replicas. So there's basically this concept of in-sync replicas uh, on a per-topic basis, and that's basically going to be which replicas need to receive messages for that topic to be replicating successfully. And then we've also got uh, just general configurations on a per-topic basis, as well as the locations of each partition, right? Which actual node that they're living on. So basically, when Kafka was first created, uh, it used an external process, Zookeeper, which we've spoken about plenty on this channel. It's a configuration service, and it used it in order to manage this, or rather not a configuration service, but a coordination service. So what does that Zookeeper-based controller look like? Basically, the controller in Kafka is responsible for handling all of these meta metadata updates. It's one component that simultaneously lives on one of the Kafka brokers, but here I'm just drawing it as if it were separate. And the idea is that it is receiving metadata updates from brokers or possibly its own, right? Because we're, it's going to be heart beating with all these brokers as well to constantly determine whether or not they're up or down. Because it's a single node, it makes doing things like leader elections a lot more simple because it's making the final decision. We don't really have to worry about split brains. So it's getting these metadata updates from the controller. It's sending every single one of them up to Zookeeper. Zookeeper is going to be the source of truth because Zookeeper internally uses consensus across a bunch of different nodes, right? Like Zookeeper isn't really one node like this. It's actually, you know, say three or five nodes that are all communicating with one another. And so we use Zookeeper to basically store this metadata in a fault tolerant way. And then once the controller hears back from Zookeeper and says, hey, that thing that you just wrote has been successfully persisted, it's now going to send information back to all of the brokers. Now, the nice thing about Zookeeper as well is because it is a single source of truth, what that actually means is that you can basically go ahead and uh, you know, have a controller fail, and then a newly elected controller, or not necessarily a newly elected controller, but a second uh, Kafka broker can say, wait a second, it doesn't seem like the controller's up anymore, I haven't gotten heartbeat pinged in a hot second, so let me reach out to Zookeeper. Zookeeper is going to say, oh wait, no one else has claimed the leader position yet, you're now the leader, and we don't have to worry about split brain because all rights in Zookeeper are linearizable, and so it's not going to be possible for two nodes to claim the leader at the same time. So there are a few different issues with using a controller that basically proxies everything to Zookeeper. For starters, uh, we just now have to have a second process in our distributed system. This is going to be a lot less appealing for developers who are just working with small systems or trying to test things out, right? If I'm a small company and I'm like, I don't really need to scale things out, then all of a sudden you now have to run multiple processes and it becomes a whole lot more of an involved process. Maybe you want to get Docker involved or something like that, rather than just running locally on uh, your local JVM or something like that. And so they wanted to try and move towards a one single process approach. Uh, and also, this is just going to make uh, you know dealing with version control and things like that a lot easier. Um, broker failures are also pretty complex in this whole Zookeeper and controller combo. Controller failures are very complex in this combo, and we're going to talk about those in the next slides. And then also, finally, you can have this problem of diverging metadata views, right? So particularly with the controller and Zookeeper, these are two different systems, right? And the controller is pushing updates to Zookeeper. But there may be a time where a controller believes the state of the system to be one thing, and it's trying to write to Zookeeper, but the change hasn't yet been propagated there. And so there's a temporary moment where they don't actually agree on what the state of the world is. There is also going to be the case that the controllers and the brokers themselves have a different state of the world on them, and we'll talk about that in a second. So basically, uh, with the Zookeeper approach, in the articles that I'm mostly citing for this video, they found that there was more or less a hard set limit of 200,000 topic partitions within a Kafka cluster, or else it would basically become infeasible to run this whole thing due to having to manage too much metadata. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the broker failure scenario. Because basically the idea here is that when we have a broker like this guy, and it goes down, 
it was hosting probably a certain number of topic partitions because it was the leader for them, right? Every single topic partition is replicated, but one of those replicas is noted as the leader. And so if that broker holding them fails, every single partition that it is the leader for it now has to be uh, sent to a new broker uh, to be led over there. So in this case, if the broker goes down, the controller is probably going to be heart beating it. And when it does that, now all of a sudden it has to write, however many partitions were on here, it has to write metadata for them to Zookeeper. And so that's going to be O of the number of partitions that were hosted by that broker. Now you may be thinking, oh, well, Jordan, doesn't Zookeeper have some sort of batch API? Uh, that was actually the first question that I thought. Uh, as far as I can tell, for whatever reason, Kafka wasn't using it. It seems like maybe they introduced some sort of batch write a little bit later on, or it was something where they wanted to try and keep the version of Zookeeper used as compatible as possible. But for whatever reason, it does seem like the amount of writes to be made when this individual broker fails is linear to the number of partitions that it was hosting. And so as a result, uh, this operation can get really expensive the more metadata that we get. And as we know, writing to Zookeeper is not particularly fast at all. Uh, in fact, they're very slow because it has to use some sort of quorum replication internally where you know we have to write to either one of these other replicas within Zookeeper. So that just gets slower and slower. So that's a bottleneck. And also, uh, you know, if the broker goes down, any cache metadata that it stores is in memory. And so if a broker comes back up, it now has to read a bunch of state from Zookeeper or perhaps from the controller. Uh, but there's just a lot of data that has to go ahead and get sent to it, which is going to take it longer to start back up on a failure. Basically, a similar scenario occurs with the controller. So if we do have one controller, and you know it used to be the one controller in the Kafka cluster, and it were to go down, all of a sudden, like we mentioned, a new controller is going to go ahead and get elected. It goes to Zookeeper, it proposes and says, hey, you know, like, I want to be the leader now. I see that there's no current controller, so let me be the one single controller. Zookeeper says, sure, I see that no one is currently the controller, so that sounds good to me. And then from there, the new controller is going to have to basically fetch all of the metadata associated with the Kafka cluster. And in practice, that operation is really expensive. It could actually take multiple minutes, which means that if you don't have a controller running, you actually have multiple minutes of downtime in your Kafka cluster. And so this basically becomes a single point of failure. Sure, you can fail over, but 10 minutes of your Kafka cluster not working is going to be very, very problematic for certain services. The last thing that we uh, needed to touch upon a little bit, which was an issue with Zookeeper, was this concept of diverging views. So I already mentioned how the controller and Zookeeper themselves can diverge. But keep in mind that the controller is the one that's actually dissipating updates to each broker, right? Whenever there's some sort of metadata change. So in that case, basically what happens here is that let's imagine the controller, you know, makes some sort of metadata change. It alerts broker one in step one, and then it goes down before it can tell broker two. Actually rectifying that down the line is a very complex process. You know, you have to figure out what metadata change got sent to what broker, and it's not always the easiest thing. A new controller is now going to get elected controller two, and then it has to figure out, hey, like I have to go to broker two now and make sure everything's up to date. So it's not trivial to do that. So what's the proposed solution here? Basically, uh, in summary, it's kind of using Raft, but within Kafka. That's why it's called Kafka Raft for KRAFT. So we've spoken about Raft on this channel plenty as well. Short uh, summary of it is that it's yet another distributed consensus protocol um, between a bunch of different distributed logs, right? Our goal is to build a distributed fault tolerant log such that if any of the nodes holding that log goes down, we can tolerate that failure and potentially switch over to a new leader uh, for our uh, raft algorithm. So I'm not gonna go into the algorithm too much because we've devoted a lot of time to that on this channel already, but I am gonna focus on how in particular Kafka is implementing it. So basically, they've got one single topic that is central and not partitioned called the metadata topic. So this is for all metadata within the cluster. You know, who's holding what in sync replicas, who, uh, which partition is up or down, things like that. So basically, uh, every single one of uh, these controller nodes that we have can either be on its own node in the Kafka cluster or it can be co-located with broker nodes and there are trade-offs associated with both of them just in terms of you know, how many available brokers you have versus you know, your resource trade-offs or things like that. So basically, let's imagine that this is a broker node, this is a broker node, pretty much all of these are brokers but you know, some of them also have controller processes that are co-located with them as well. One of those controllers is considered the leader We've also got some followers, 
And then these are considered the voting ones, right? So in the same way that with Raft or Paxos you can have voting replicas, you can also have non-voting replicas. So basically these are your typical Kafka brokers, right? Every single Kafka broker is actually considered an observer of the metadata topic, meaning that it's basically passively replicating and caching that log that is being created through KRAFT. So every single normal broker, regardless of whether uh, you know, it necessarily needs all of those metadata changes, is going to be listening to the entire metadata topic and you know, hosting a replica of it locally. Additionally, the leader, of course, in the same way with Raft, is fault tolerant. So if for whatever reason this guy were to go down, uh, one of these two voting replicas could possibly take over. Also with KRAFT, you know, we're using quorum voting, meaning that every single write that is made on the leader needs to be accepted by one of the two voting replicas before it can be considered fully committed. So let's talk about some design decisions quickly in KRAFT so that we can make a little bit more sense of what's going on here. Well, for starters, uh, in Kafka, in our previous video, we talked about normal replication in Kafka. So they make a few design choices there. For starters, they don't actually necessarily always take every single write on a broker and instantly sync it to disk for performance reasons. But here in the metadata queue, we very much do, right? We want to sync every single log to the disk or every single log entry to the disk because we want it to be persistent. This is important data. We don't want to be losing it. It's going to slow things down a bit, but there aren't that many writes to this topic, so it is okay. Another thing that we're noting here is that we're using quorums, right? We're using Raft over the concept of normal replication in Kafka, which uses in-sync replicas. Now, we did this trade-off a little bit last video, but the idea there is that quorums inherently are nice because, you know, you're not bottlenecked by the slowest replica in your group of voting nodes, right? If one of them is slow, it's okay because you only need to hear from a majority of replicas. That being said, using the in-sync replica strategy basically means that uh, you are bottlenecked by the slowest replica of the in-sync replicas, but you can tolerate more failures. As long as there's one in-sync replica alive, you're still good to go. In the case of the metadata queue, they figured, you know what, we want this thing to be relatively low latency because there's only one partition here. So the entire distributed cluster is using it and we want it to scale as well as possible without getting bogged down too quickly. So ultimately we choose not to use the in-sync replica strategy and we go with KRAFT instead. And then finally, it's worth noting that the type of replication that we do in KRAFT is very standard to the rest of Kafka, right? Typically in Raft, you would have the leader pushing entries over to the followers. But actually in KRAFT, you've got the follower fetching batches of entries from the leader. This has a few nice improvements. For starters, one of them is that, you know, we're just getting message batching, which means that in theory, you might be able to get a little bit more throughput here. Number two is that we no longer have this concept of disruptive servers, or at least it greatly mitigates it. In Raft, what is kind of possible is that, you know, uh, you have followers that are always waiting for the leader to ping them. And so if for whatever reason the follower has some sort of network partition and the leader says, you know what, I'm no longer going to ping this follower, I'm going to remove it as a voting replica, if the follower can't hear from the leader, it's never actually going to know that it was removed from the, the set of voting replicas. And so it's going to constantly be starting leader elections, and it's going to be disruptive to the other nodes in the cluster, because all the other nodes are going to have to constantly go ahead and say, no, no, this is not a valid leader election. So basically what happens here by using poll-based fetching is that every single one of these uh, voting replicas can go to the leader and say, hey, you're still the leader, right? Do you have any more entries for me? And if for whatever reason it is no longer a voting replica or anything has changed such that it should no longer be speaking to this leader, the leader can respond, hey, you know, don't talk to me anymore, like you're done. And that way it won't become a disruptive replica. Great, so before we move on, I want to quickly touch upon one pretty central theme of this change that makes it so efficient and makes it so good compared to uh, you know, the Zookeeper approach. In the controller failure and in the broker failure, one common theme that we see is that if something is to fail, we have to now fetch and cache all of the metadata from Zookeeper. Note how that in the KRAF proposed solution, every single node, whether it is a voting node or it is a broker node, is actually going to cache all of that information. So even though it may be slightly behind from the leader, the point is, if for whatever reason it goes down and it comes back up, it's going to have the majority of the information already there, and the incremental amount that it has to fetch in order to start running again is very small. This makes failovers extremely quick compared to Zookeeper, which is the main impact of this change. The last thing that I want to talk about before we finish off this video is this concept of managing the queue size uh, in the metadata queue.
So basically, this guy is going to keep growing in size, right? Uh, it's not really any way for us to compact it. Uh, for the most part, these entries are you know independent of one another, but there is one unified metadata state at any point in time, and you know we can kind of convey that using something like a snapshot. So basically, if this log gets up to you know many many hundreds or thousands of entries, what we can basically do is take a snapshot, associate that with some offset in the log, and then you only have to store any entries after that snapshot. Then, if a broker or you know uh, a voting replica requests entries from the leader that are you know before that snapshot offset, you can just load the snapshot and then load any supplemental entries from the from the log as needed. So let's go ahead and give an example of that. Let's imagine we've got a leader. It's got entries 10, 11, and 12 in its local disk, and it also has the snapshot up to log 9 stored on its local disk. The reason we do this is because it's cheaper, or in terms of disk space, it's cheaper to store the snapshot up to log 9 than it is log entries 0 through 9. So what that means is that we can get rid of log entries 0 through 9 on the leader broker and save ourselves a lot of space. If we have some sort of follower broker uh, that you know wants to get the metadata entries, and maybe only has all entries up to log seven, the first thing that it's gonna do is go to the leader and say, hey, I want entries from offset eight. The leader is gonna say, ooh, offset eight, I don't actually have that cached anymore, so here's what you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to load the snapshot from offset nine, or sorry, up and including nine. And then once you do that, you're now going to fetch from offset 10 onwards because it actually stores those entries. And so this way the broker is able to get up to date, but we can ensure that this topic doesn't grow boundlessly in size and take up everyone's local disk, which is very, very important. All right, let's go ahead and conclude this video because it is uh, going to hopefully make a little bit more sense why this KRAF thing is so useful. For starters, it's just going to make the system easier to deploy in cloud environments. It's always easier when you're only deploying one thing, you, know, you have less to think about. And it's also just easier to run locally now. Number two is that it's going to greatly speed up both broker and controller shutdown, right? Because we need to go ahead and cache all of this metadata and you know fetch it on startup time, uh, doing the incremental fetch is much cheaper when the majority of the log entries are already on that particular broker or controller node that is being started up. Number two, or uh, another you know separate detail about uh, this whole process, or KRAFT in general, is that we want to use quorums as opposed to in-sync replicas. We already spoke about why, but the point is every single uh, node in this cluster is going to be using this topic, and limiting the tail latencies of it can be very, very useful for ensuring that you know we can have as many topic partitions as possible in one particular cluster. I hope this video was helpful, guys. Uh, I've been hearing about KRAF for a while, personally, and I didn't really understand what the big hullabaloo was, so this starts to make a lot more sense to me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, and have a great day.